Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and happy Monday to you all. My name is Joe McBeth, and I am the Executive Director of the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. Thank you for joining us this morning for the last of our series of webinars that we have hosted with the fine people from the New York State Office of People with Developmental Disabilities and the Air Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation. This may be the last, but it's, it's been the one I've been looking forward to the most. Um, I'll introduce our guest speaker in a moment. Um, just a couple of very brief updates before we turn it over to Tish. Um, we hope you join us on our next two webinars. Uh, we've got two really good webinars coming up in early August. On August 8th, at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, with Dave Hingsberger and John Raphael. Uh, the title of this webinar will be Living Locally, Understanding Community Supervision. And after everything that's happened done in North Miami, Florida last week, I think that's a very timely webinar. The following day on August 9th at 2 p.m., our Learning Annex with NADSP faculty member Chumi Tversky with The Power of Attitude. Uh, direct support professionals attitude and the power that that brings along with it. So those two webinars, we'll be posting those on our website and getting information out to you. Um, also, I want to just remind everybody that Direct Support Pro Recognition Week, national and New York State Direct Support Professional Recognition Week is, is coming up soon, September 11th through 17th. We'll be sending out all kinds of information, but if anybody wants to order in advance uh, NADSP Code of Ethics cards or Code of Ethics posters or NADSP t-shirts or silicon wrist bracelets, contact Tanya Moyer at tmoyer, T-M-O-Y-E-R, at nadsp.org. Um, we're also going to be having some really nice specials on DSPR registration, the first level of our credential, um, as we have for the last four or five years. So those are my updates. Um, I want, I'm, I'm really, really proud and, and honored to introduce Letitia Alcorn. Um, I, we call her Tish. Uh, Tish is uh, currently the secretary of People Are Beautiful, a self-advocacy group in central New York, and the former president of, of that organization. She's also perhaps one of the strongest allies and supporters of direct support professionals that I've had the pleasure to meet. Um, she is front and center on many of these issues. Tish receives supports and services from Herkimer Area Resource Center, that's Herkimer ARC, and um, she's also a mom. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tish and and just let you know, Tish, that I am so proud of you and thankful to you for, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this webinar. So thanks a lot, Tish. Thanks, Joe, and good morning, everybody. Like Joe said, my name is Letitia Alcorn, and I'm on the Workforce Transformation Committee. I'm also the Secretary of People Are Beautiful, which is affiliated with Turkmer ARC, and I am a Sani's grassroots presenter. I wanted to include my contact information for anybody who wanted to send me any questions. Um, what I'm going to be going over today is I'm going to be telling you what workforce transformation means to me, how it affects my life, and how it affects my family. I'm also going to be talking about the core competencies, the performance eval, the difference in a caregiver versus direct support, and the difference between the caregiver and direct support way. Workforce transformation. It sounds scarier than it is, and a lot of people are asking me, what does it mean? Well, to me, it's a process of improving how my direct support professional works with their individuals, or specifically for me, how Chrissy works with me. That's all it is. It's nothing scary. We are changing from the old caregiver way to the direct supported way. Why? Because the old caregiver way left the individuals with no voices and no choices. Where the direct supported way is nothing about us without us, which is Sandy's mission statement, but it still holds true for this. 
um, the direct support of WEG helps us to make decisions on our own terms and that we get to make the decisions where the caregiver way we weren't. And I'm going to give you guys some examples of things that I've had experienced in my life for the caregiver way and then also with a direct supported way. The old caregiver way. Like I said, it left us with no voices and no choices. Our decisions were made for us, not because they didn't care, but because people really thought that they knew what was best for us. And maybe there was a time and a place for the caregiver way, but it's not anymore. A great example for me with the caregiver way would be dinner. I lived in a group home at one point, and anyone who knows me knows I am a hot sauce freak. I carry hot sauce in my purse. And when I moved into the group home, I was told that one of the individuals that lived there couldn't have spices in their um, diet. And as a result, I was told I couldn't keep hot sauce in the refrigerator. I understood that as, okay, it's hiding in my closet now. And for about the first week, uh, it took them about a week to catch on that there was hot sauce in my closet because I'd take my plate in my room and douse it with hot sauce and bring it back out. And then my house manager talked to me and told me I had to get rid of the case of hot sauce I had hidden in my closet. And I wasn't a happy camper about it, but she told me that it wasn't fair that I got to doctor up my meals when another individual couldn't. And that was just an example of a, a choice that I didn't get to have. I should have been able to have that choice. Another example of where my voice wasn't used is on the weekends. In a group home, um, you often have to do what, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it, what the house wants to do. And, and that's what the staff came up with for everybody. What that meant for me is I got to watch the Care Bear movie three times because nobody else in my house was able to watch the adult films that I was able to watch, as opposed to watching something like um, Fast and the Furious. I was never allowed to watch that in the movies. I had to watch the Care Bear movie or whatever the group or the house could watch. And that just left me with no voice of what I would like to do. The direct supported way. Our voices are being heard. And they really are make nothing about us without us. And they are teaching us informed decision making, which is good because we're finally learning what good and bad decisions have an effect on our life. And we get to make the decision, which is a, a big thing before where, you know, I can decide how much hot sauce I want on my food where before I couldn't. A great example for me is Christmas shopping. I absolutely love to give gifts more so than getting gifts. And when I lived in the group home, I was told that I could only spend $5 on people and I could only buy for my immediate family, which was my mother and my father. Now, with my direct support professional, we make a list of who I want to buy or make things for. And I put a budget per that person. So my mother, I may want to spend $20 on, and my son, I may want to spend $50 on. And then we start Christmas shopping, usually around July, so I can fit everybody on my list. This is just one of the ways that my direct support professional supports me. Another example would be, you know, trips, that they can support you with trips, they can support you with jobs, and even dating. I've had some direct support professionals who helped me do the pro and con versus um, to see which kind of guy I would really be good with and who I really wanted to spend with my time with and did I really want to connect with someone who couldn't connect with me. And it helped me a lot. Um, I'm now married because I did that. So that really helped me a lot. What workforce transformation means to me, this is my family. I'm learning to be a better mother for my son, Gabriel, and I'm learning to be a better wife for my husband, Michael. And it all started because my direct support professional started working with me. How is my direct support professional helping me achieve this? Well, she decided to do the direct support project. She challenged herself to learn the direct supported way. How? By using the core competencies. Now, I know you guys have probably heard of the core competencies, but I'm going to briefly run down them, and then I'm going to tell you how I interpret them with, with my direct support professional. 
putting people first, positive relationships, be professional, health, safety, home life, and get into the community. Now I'm going to tell you how I interpret these. Putting people first. Know me. Not the file me, the paperwork me, but actually know me. Because I've changed, but my paperwork has not. My paperwork when I first started will tell you that I was very emotional um, and that I was very aggressive and I was very outspoken. And I still pretty much am very outspoken, but I'm not as abrupt as I used to be. And if you really know me, you'll do the rest of these. You will be able to empower me. You will be able to help build me up. And you will help me find and use my voice. And for a self-advocate like me, it's kind of funny to think I need help finding my voice. But if it comes for groups of people like professionals or injustice for people with disabilities, I have no problem lending my voice to that. I do have a problem using my voice when it comes to things for me and advocating for things that I would like to go through or experience in my life. And that is where my direct support professional really has to help me be able to do that. Positive relationships. One way to have in the positive relationship with me is to talk to me, not about me, not above me, not below me. Talk directly to me. Encourage me. And, and this next one is a big one for me. You don't always have to agree with me, but you do have to support me. And I have a really great example of this. One of my DSPs when I was going to college, um, he is atheist, and I respect that. I am a Christian. And in between classes, I would attend a college club, which was a Christian club. And it was really you would have thought it would be difficult for him because there's praying and there was worship going on and reading of the Bible. and It relaxed me before I went to my next class. But he would sit there with me. He would actually go through the scriptures with me and break down anything that I didn't understand. Um, he didn't take part in the praying, but he knew that that was a very big part of my life. And he supported me through that. And if I had issues with things in class, he would be the first one to tell me, you know, maybe you just need to pray about it. And, and that was a big deal to me. And because he was able to support me even when he didn't agree with my outlook on things, I was able to trust him. And trust is a big thing through any relationship, not just direct supported with. Any relationship, you have to have trust. Friendship, uh, marriage, dating, you, you want all of that. Be professional. If you're going to be professional, you have to respect me and respect, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to respect the position that you have, but you also need to respect the experiences that I've went through. Accept that we are different. Don't embarrass me or belittle me. And don't introduce me to people as your client or your individual, etc. One of the things that I've had done numerous times, and I'm not a big fan of it, is we run into somebody at Walmart and one of my direct support professionals would say, this is Tish, and she's my client or my individual or whatever label they're giving me this week. And I would get frustrated because, first, if they know you, then they know that you work with Herkimer Area Resource Center, so they can just assume that I am your individual. I shouldn't have to be put in that category. Also, just because you know them doesn't mean I want to know them. And if I feel that I should introduce myself then I will do that. That You're kind of taking away somebody's voice when you're saying, well, this is my client, Tesh. You're taking away my voice and taking away an option of me introducing myself and them getting to know me because you just, and it may be seen as a form of polite, but it's, it's kind of not when you look at it that way. And keep our conversations private. Um, there is a little stipulation here, if I'm talking to you and I'm saying I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to go kill somebody, by all means, break this clause. Um, but it goes back to the first part where you really need to know me. If I'm getting in the car and I am just got out of a meeting and I'm angry and I sit there and say I would like to kill this person because they wouldn't let me express what I was feeling, then know that I'm not going to actually physically kill them. I'm just angry. And that part you can just keep to yourself, but if you really are worried about my safety, then by all means, don't keep our conversation private. Go tell somebody. Health. 
encouraged me to make healthy decisions, explain any health care paperwork to me, help me to be prepared for an emergency situation. For me, this is just simply is staying calm. I am CPR and first aid certified. However, when emergencies happen with my husband or with my son, I do not stay calm at all, and all that wonderful, beautiful training goes out the window. Um, so this is something that Chrissy is working on with me. Chrissy is my direct support professional, is to stay calm in emergency situations so I can not be part of the emergency. And assist me with healthy meals. But with the healthy meals, you need to understand that eating healthy isn't always an option. Um, I think too many people just see this on your goals that you want to eat healthy and just think you're going to switch to salads and, you know, change your whole diet and you can't really do that, especially if you're on a budget. It's $12 for boneless, skinless chicken breast and it's, that could get me a couple packs of hot dogs for the month. So it's not always an option to eat healthy, especially if you're on a budget, but help me to try to eat healthy. You know, encourage me to drink more water, whatever and less soda. That's one of the ways that you can really assist me without trying to make me change everything. Safety. Teach me about any safety and be updated on all your trainings. Not just like your CPR and first aid, but on any trainings that you need with me. I have two types of seizures. I have grandma's, but I also have staring seizures. I can't tell you how many times I've had staff say, I don't know what just happened. You zoned out on me for 15, 20 minutes, and I don't know how to deal with that. And it was a staring seizure. Um, so if you're going to work with me, please know both sides of me. There's the paperwork of me that you need to know, but there's also the personal side of me that you need to know. And help me create a plan to keep my family safe. Keep me safe and be safe when you're with me. Now, there's a story that goes to this. And so I was actually with a direct support professional for a while. And even though she was trained all the proper procedures, I think it kind of flooded her mind at the moment. But we were in a car accident, and I was hit on my side. Thankfully, nothing bad happened where, you know, I was hospitalized or anything like that. It could have been worse. But my first reaction was, are you okay? Her first reaction was, this was your fault because we were rushing because you were late. And from that point on, I was not calm. I was not okay. And I didn't stay calm in the emergency situation. And I was out of that car trying to figure out how to calm myself down, what just happened, was I really okay. And that whole situation just blew up in my face. And had she actually started with the basic of be safe with me, and ask me if I'm okay. I probably would have been able to deal with the, the situation a lot better, but as a result in the fact that she didn't really work on that part of her training, I didn't stay calm. And there were, was a lot more that happened emotionally than that happened physically. And so that was a big issue for me. Home life. When you're working in your group homes that, or coming into my home, you need to respect it, just the same way I would respect your home. Don't come into somebody's house and say, this is a pigsty or a mess. It may be that way. I've had people come in, and when I first got my first apartment, I had books everywhere because I didn't have bookshelves, but they were neatly stacked. And I immediately got wrote off as my house was a pigsty, even though they were neatly stacked. And as a result, I didn't want her to come in my home anymore because I didn't feel like she rejected respected it. But you also need to help me to learn the skills that I need to survive. And, and this particular one for me is paying bills on time. We don't really get that whole concept of, okay, I have $125 and I have a $90 cell phone bill and I also want to go Christmas shopping. Which one do I really want to do? Can I pay the bill later and then do the Christmas shopping now? So um, this is one of the things that Chrissy works with me on also is really managing which ones I need to focus on first. Then she helps me budget for the things I need and want, which would be Christmas shopping. Help me to adapt to my environment. This is something I'm still working on. I live in Section 8 housing right now, so I have neighbors above me, neighbors next to me. And at 3 a.m., 
my neighbor likes to blast his music and wake my son and me up. And I've learned to have to adapt to that. And I've learned the right way to um, communicate with him on this because part of me just wants to go up there and scream, turn down your stuff, I'm listening, going to sleep. And actually, I've learned to adapt to it and to be more polite towards, it, towards him and to deal with it appropriately. But also teach us household skills. I had to teach myself how to cook, and I had to teach myself how to do laundry, which meant a lot of my clothes came out bleach stained for the first couple times because I didn't have that as my goal. I didn't really think I needed it. But in your home life, you, you need it to survive. You need to be able to do laundry. You need to be able to cook. You need to be able to clean and understand how to do it properly. There is a right way to do everything. Get into the community I personally didn't have any um, struggles with, but I went and talked to some of my fellow self-advocates, and this is what they helped me to understand what getting into the community comes with them. And first they wanted to learn how to connect with the people that have the same interest with them. So that would be like church groups and clubs, and um, you know, there's one person who said that he actually goes to classes in um, in the library and he had to meet people who wanted to do that too. And so I think that's really important for them that if you want them to be part of a community, they need to connect with the people there in some way, shape, or form. Communication. And, and this is different than just talking because I can talk to my husband any way I want, but if I go upstairs and talk to the guy upstairs the same way I talk to my husband, there's going to be a bunch of issues. So teach me how to communicate appropriately and correctly for the situation. I'm not going to go talk to my neighbor the same way that I talk to the person at the bank or the same way that I talk to a lawyer about different things or even to my pastor. So we need to learn to communicate um, to people properly and how to approach them instead of just saying, hey, dude, we need to talk, you know, to approach them almost professionally um, and how to deal with the different situations that come up through communication, arguments and disagreements. But also employment. Not just get me a job in the community, but help me get a job that I can grow in and that my skills can grow in and that I like and that I can feel that this is where I need to be. Um, this is a big thing that I'm going through with my husband right now is he's trying to find a job that he feels he can grow in and it's really important for him to be part of the community to do that. Also, we need to know our local government and our laws. If we're supposed to follow these laws, then we need to know our laws. Also, it can also go back to the home life thing. If I know my renter's rights, I know what my landlord is supposed to be fixing and what I'm not supposed to be fixing. And so there's less chance for me to be taken advantage of. And there's more of a chance for me to grow. And also to be safe in our community. I actually have a friend who is going through these, these last two um, right now. He moved out of a developmental center into the community. And once the community found out that he came from the developmental center, they had an issue because they just kind of had this idea that this was some kind of bad person or something. And um, because he didn't really know his rights, he got taken advantage of a lot with his landlord. and. Um, once he got educated, he was actually able to fight for his rights, but he still doesn't feel safe in that, in that apartment building because people have an issue with the fact that he has a disability. And he needs his staff to be able to come in and show him how to be safe. It's more than just locking the door and not answering if you don't know the, the number. It is so much more than that. It's about feeling safe and how to make us feel safe in the community, and I struggle with this sometimes. If Michael's gone and it's nighttime, I don't feel comfortable home alone either with all the craziness that's going on in our world. So you need to find a way to really help us be safe in our community. What the core competencies, core competencies evaluation tool means to me and my family. But before I get to that, I'm going to start with what is it? For anybody who doesn't know what this is, it's a process that measures how DSPs are working with individuals. What I love about it is now I have standards. 
now I know what my direct support professional is supposed to be doing with me and what can fly and what's not. I really wish I knew this a long time ago. I would have found Chrissy sooner. And now our voices can be heard. Where before, if we, we were afraid to file a complaint with um, you know, our direct support professional or with their supervisor for fear that we might get backlash from it or judged from it or just the fact that we may lose our direct support professional. Where now with the core competency evaluation tool, we can have our voices be heard without he worrying about that fear of what if they find out, what if um, I'm, I'm completely wrong, what if they're doing it right and I'm doing it wrong. So it just kind of gives me a piece personally thinking about that I can evaluate my staff by the standards that I know that they have. And now DSPs know what is expected with them. I've had a couple DSPs come in and say, I really don't know how to work on this skill with you and I don't know if this is okay. And so now with the evaluation tool, they will be able to see that, okay, this is, this is how I'm supposed to work on this with Letitia. And this is how I'm supposed to be doing this for everybody, not just changing it up every now and then. I need to be doing this for everybody. And if I do that, I'm going to have an outstanding evaluation to come back from. And I think that's really important. Because like in school, you had report cards and you could see where you were so you could learn where you needed to work more, you know, math, science. For the direct support professionals, now they know, okay, communication with Letitia is great, but maybe the home life situation isn't so great. I need to work on that with her. And that's okay. DSPs are learning just as much as we are. If we do all of this, if, if we get all the core competencies involved with the individuals that you work with and you do the evaluations, then I truly believe that the direct supported way will help all of us grow to be the best versions of ourselves. And that is really important for me because everybody needs to be able to be part of their own life. And um, in the group home, I didn't feel like I had a life. I felt like it was just the group home's way of doing it. Where now, I can honestly say this is the best version of my life that I've ever had. I'm happily married, I have a son, and I know I'm working towards a college goal and working for direct support professionals and doing things that I've always dreamed of doing but never thought I could do. And it's all because I started doing this with my direct support professional and she started working with me. Again, if you need to contact me, this is my email address and you can get a hold of me any way you'd like or whenever you'd like. And thank you and if you have any questions, you can um, look stuff up at the workforcetransformation.org and you can send me questions right here and I'll try my best to answer them. Wow. This is Joe Tish. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. And I think, I mean, and I knew that you would do this, you bring it right to that level of interaction between the direct support professional and the person receiving support. And your examples from your, from your life illustrate so well the need for competencies. So thank you. Um, here's a question. I'm, I, haven't, I haven't proved it yet. Um, but let me read it to you. Wow, Letitia, I have taken a lot of notes and I'm so glad I called in this morning. I have a question. Any DSPs sometimes hear from people that they don't want one more professional in their lives and the object to and they object to the very name direct support professionals. What do you say to this? So let me rephrase this. We do hear that. Uh, the last thing that people need in their lives is another professional. We already have the nurse, the dietitian, the psychologist, the social worker. Um, and, and now you're saying we need another professional in our lives. We don't want another professional in our life. What do you think about that? I personally, I disagree with that. But I think the title, people think of direct support professional is a person, and it's not. It's a profession. That is their job. You can call them whatever you would like, but pro professional to me is a standard that I want my direct support professional to be. I want her to be professional. My doctor better be professional with me. My banker better be professional with me. Why wouldn't I want my direct support professional who works hands-on with me 
to be professional too. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent answer, and I agree. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. Write them in the box. Um, we've got a couple minutes. Um, Tish, I, I I have a question for you. Um, you've been involved in this transformation uh, from the very beginning, and you've been very active and and very supportive of going from direct care to direct support. Uh, and you've traveled around a fair amount and went to a lot of meetings. What do you think about the transformation? Do you think it's working? Do you, th do you start to see changes with the people that you talk with at self-advocacy groups? What do you, and, and, and what do you think about the other self-advocates? Are, are, they, are they embracing this change or are they afraid of it? I think there's a little bit of both. I think um, the myth is that everything's going to change, that they're going to lose their direct support professionals, and I, I think they're still a little afraid of being able to evaluate them themselves. And I, I, but I personally, I'm excited about it because I remember how bad it was and how hard it was for me and Gabriel. Um, I didn't have all these skills when I first had him, and I really wished I had a direct support professional who was able to work on these goals with me because the, the great thing about the core competencies is it isn't just um, something for our direct support professionals. This can go to any part of somebody's life. It could be anything. So once we the DSPs start to teach it to us and we embrace it, then we can be able to pass it on to Gabriel. And this could be something that he could take to college and learn how to do. I mean, why shouldn't he be respecting people and having positive relationships with anybody? So I think the, the fear is that they're going to lose everything that they think they have now, but in the end result, we may lose some things, but you're going to get so much more out of this once it all rolls out and that everything starts to change for the good. Mm. Yeah, and, and I have a, I, now, now I have a lot of questions for you, but <laughs> one more before I get to one that's written down. Um, you know, when, when we take a look at how even when I was a direct support professional, um, and it sounds like some of the DSPs that supported you, um, it, was, it was more about um, following the plan and some of the rules kind of set up a scenario where it was kind of power and control. And even your... your your example of the hot sauce was really kind of about power and control. But when you take a look at the code of ethics and these new competency areas, it's less about power and control and more about partnership between the DSP and the person who gets supports. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. It's totally a partnership. Um, because now we get to help lead the way, we get to help make the decisions, and our voices can be heard in our decisions. You may not agree with it, we may not agree with you, but we still get to voice our concerns and our feelings in our life, which is a big deal. Or yeah. before, I didn't get to do that. Yeah, and I don't know if you're familiar with the new um, home and community-based settings rule that came out from the federal government about, uh, well, almost a year and a half. Um, and it talks about people receiving supports will have the authority to write their own plans to the extent possible. So you would be able to write your own plans, and I would imagine somebody like you would probably want to sit down with your DSP and say, what are we going to work on together? You know what I mean? Rather than having yeah. somebody else, like a service coordinator, writing, writing your plan, you may not only see your service coordinator coordinator once a month or so, right? Right. Would you take advantage of that opportunity to write your own plan? I probably would. I would probably have my staff sit with me just so I knew how to do it. But yeah, I would probably write my own goals. I pretty much do anyways. Yeah. Um, I just sit there and tell them, look, I don't want to work on this anymore. Or I've already achieved this and surpassed it. Let's find something else. Or yeah. I'm still working on this goal. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that you would. Here's a here's a question for you. Um, is there a network of of advocacy organizations across the state? And I'm I'm assuming this is New York State. Um, so is there more than 
people are beautiful? Local self-advocacy groups? And if so, where can they find out about that? Do you, do you know? I, I know for New York State, there is SANIs, which is the Self-Advocates of New York, Self-Advocate Association of New York State, and that they are all over New York. Um, in September, we actually have the state conference where people from all over the New York State come and we do meet. And I do know that they are, there is one per county or per region. I know that um, in Herkimer County alone, we have, Her there's one in Herkimer, which is People Are Beautiful, and then there's also one in Little Falls. So I would imagine that there is one, I, I don't know where this person is, but I know that there's um, also some out in Syracuse and Binghamton, Broome County, um, Schoharie. So I, I think it's just a matter of trying to, if you're in New York, to look up Sandy's website and you can find a group there that's near you. Yeah. And connect. Yeah, I, I'm on it right now, Tish. It's S A N Y S dot org. Sanies dot org. And I'm sure there's contact information for people to, to look at if they have any questions. Um, great presentation, Tish. No more questions. So I'll tell you what, this was fantastic. And I also took a lot of notes. So Tish, you did a great job. Thanks so much. And I look forward to seeing you soon on the road. Any final words, Tish? Any, any, anything else you want to say before we say goodbye? Just thank you for the opportunity to do this. I can actually cross this off my bucket list, too. <laughs> well, you did great, Tish. Thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, again, August 8th, 2 p.m., with Dave Hingsberger and John Raphael on Living Locally, Understanding Community Supervision. And the following day, August 9th, our Learning Annex with uh, NADSP faculty member Connie Twersky, The Power of Attitude. So with that, I thank you all for joining us. Have a great week. It's only Monday, and a lot of people are on vacation, so you have to work twice as hard. Thanks for joining us. Bye.